you know, there's uh, there's some soccer, mm -hmm. uh, but some people call it football. The tagline for this year is season two, winging it. <laughs> 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 I got involved in Ted Lasso from the original commercials that we did uh, for NBC Sports. I've known Jason for a really long time. We've worked together on things, and actually, it was a it was a bad news, good news phone call. I had done a scene in We're the Millers, um, my first ever proper scene in a uh, in a film, and it was with him. And I was being edited at the time, and he called me to say, "Your scene's been cut out of the movie," which is a bummer. But what are you gonna do? But then he was like, "But I got this soccer thing, and it was just to go to London for a few days to do this commercial, and now." I'm still in London, <laughs> and it's TV show, it's my life, and I'm talking to you. So it really, it's probably the best, you know, percentage-wise, bad news, good news phone call I will ever have for the rest of my life. Uh, I got involved first as a writer because I'd worked with Bill Lawrence before. I'd done a pilot with him. He called me up. I mean, I think back on this and I think I nearly, it's so much, I had a gig booked in. He called me up and said, <laughs> I said, oh, I think you'd be right for this show, for Ted Lasso. And I knew Ted Lasso because the original sketches were at Tottenham, which is my team. So I was like, oh yeah, yeah. He said, do you want to come and do this? You'd have to be in LA like in a week or something. And I was like, I've got some gear. I've got some stand-up shows booked in. <laughs> and he was like, you're f***ing mad if you if you <laughs> turn this down for some stand-up gigs. And I was like, well, you know, they booked it. I, you know, I don't like to let people down. <laughs> And he said, well, you'll have to talk to Jason first, see if you get on. And me and Jason did a FaceTime at like one in the morning my time. And we talked for like an hour and a half. And at the end of it, I was like, I think we're, I think we're in love. And then and then I got caught. And then like on Saturday, I was told, get on a plane tomorrow and be here on Monday. And I did. And it was the best. I mean, for the people I let down at that, for the 40 people who were coming to that stand up gig, <laughs> I can only apologize, <laughs> but I don't regret it. I think one of the more uh, apparent differences between Brits and Americans is uh, uh, we dress in colors and you guys dress in black. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's obvious. Um, I'm the only British person you've met since you've been here. I don't know if it's representative, but yeah, okay, yeah. And it paints a very clear picture of a nation. <laughs> one thing I'm finding here is that uh, Brits don't always say exactly what they mean, especially when they're trying to give you bad news. There's really a lot of like, oh, I don't know if we're gonna have such an easy time of doing blah, 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 which by which they mean it's not happening, but which makes me go, oh, well, try harder, you know? <laughs> you know? And they're like, can we just? Also, I lived in Holland, so I'm very used to people coming out and saying, no, not possible, no, not doing that. That's my Dutch English person, apparently. Yeah, pretty um, solid. So, um, yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of dancing around negative things. It yeah. would take me three days to tell you your scene had been cut from We're the Millers. <laughs> I'd have called you repeatedly and you'd still be like, so what's happening on We're the Millers? <laughs> I mean, I've talked about this before, but it's for me, it's like just sort of being, being, being nice to strangers, openly friendly to strangers as freaks British people out. And in America, I'm always shocked when people say, like, have a nice day. I'm always like, well, who the f I, I, we, I don't know you, what's going on? <laughs> Like it's, you know what I mean? It's, and just people saying hello when you walk in places. Hey, how you doing? Like, what? And then I often think I'm about to have a fight. That I think is a basic thing, whereas Americans are just, uh, I guess the word is friendly. What do you say to a cocktail, Coach Lasso? Oh, the same thing I'd say to Diane Sawyer if she ever asked me out on a date. Yes, please. <laughs> well, you know, I can't say too much about season two, and only partly because, though we're almost finished shooting it, we, we haven't really written it. But I'm sure that's going to be fine. You know, there's, uh, there's some soccer, mm -hmm. uh, but some people call it football. The tagline for this year is season two, winging it. <laughs> <laughs> season two, hope it for the best. <laughs> I mean, one thing I think that is out there that we can say is that we are uh, ever so lucky to have uh, Sarah Niles on the show now as um, uh, Dr. Sharon Fieldstone, who joins the team as a sports psychologist. Um, and won't get into what she does too much, but she's great. I mean, I've been a fan of her, uh, you know, from Catastrophe and then 
you know, seeing her on uh, I May Destroy You, which at that point I'm going, oh, that's a lady from Catastrophe. <laughs> uh, but now I know her name and it's Sarah Niles and we're so lucky. What can I tell you that I'm allowed to tell you? Uh, be it. Uh, I can tell you Roy's knee injury from season one was not fatal. He lost his leg though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's out there. Now they know. Yeah. Now they know. I can tell you that uh, Ted keeps his moustache and um, Beard keeps his beard. Facially, facial hair wise, it's all the things you love about season one. <laughs> it's coming straight back. Did the reaction to Keely and Roy relationship surprise me? The fact that people watched the show surprised me. Anything else is a huge bonus. The Keely and Roy, listen, Juno Temple is one of the greats and I feel incredibly uh, lucky that I had so many scenes with her. Perhaps I have more in season two, who knows? It's nice, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> It's hard to answer the question of, of what's the biggest difference between Jason and Ted because you know so much of Ted comes from at least part of Jason. Like it is a growth, you know, like a, a cyst or a goiter um, that uh, comes from DNA that has actually happened in Jason's life. I mean, Ted is a manifestation of coaches he's had and, uh, and teachers he's had and the Midwestern kindness and thoughtfulness with which he was raised. Yeah, I don't know. They're, they're just so much the same. I mean, we watch we still watch soccer games and I have to explain the offside rule to him at least once, sometimes multiple times. I'm like, we've gone over this, man. What do, what do I gotta do? All right, here's how I explain the offside rule, okay? All right, I need these four, and then give me that uh, blue uh, water bottle too, yeah. down there. Um, all right, oh no, those two cups, give me those two cups. Okay, this is a wall of defenders. There's the goal, and these two are teammates. If I want to pass the ball to that guy, he cannot be past them when I kick the ball. You got a coin? You got a coin? That's fine. Pull him out. This is the ball. This is the ball. If I kick the ball now, he's offside. If I kick the ball now, he's onside. Offside? Onside. But then if this guy goes down here, well, then he's even more onside. And these guys don't matter because it's the last defender. Uh, second to last, actually, because of the goalkeeper. But sometimes the goalkeeper comes forward, and then the defender goes in there, and the goalkeeper doesn't matter. He can be all the way over here. So it's a very simple rule. I've never been more proud of you. <laughs> that was magnificent. I mean, you do need props to explain it. It, it is very important. My go-to karaoke song, well, I mean, I have a small battery of them that I use depending on the situation and the environment, but uh, generally Run Around Sue by Dion and the Belmonts. Nice. Um, really, uh, really, it's, it's short, there's no solos in it, and it's going on like this, and it's got, it's got real emotion. So yeah, final answer, Run Around Sue. Uh, my karaoke song is Rabbit by Chaz and Day. I always remember when we did the read-through for episode four, the gala episode, that there was a real feeling in the room of like, oh, look at this <laughs> Like, everyone had their character down, everyone loved it and was so like invested and you could sort of feel it in the room. Yeah, that was the, I think the first, yeah, episode four was when I felt like this is, something's going on here. I really felt like we were around to something more than we might've expected when we got to Nate's locker room speech in episode seven. The performance of it is just, Perfect. Nate is, you know, Nick is so fantastic, uh, but it's also very well written by Jason. Everyone's reactions are perfect. You know, we had uh, Declan directing at that point. Yeah, at, th at that point, we're like, okay, we, we've got something in a bottle. Hopefully it's lightning and not, you know, poison. You're more concerned about looking tough than actually being tough. There's a way to be intimidating without being physical. I hope you don't mind me saying. Um, Sam. Oh, no. You're constantly getting beat on the wings. It's because you're indecisive. You second guess more than a psychic. <laughs> the only African I know more imprisoned by their own thoughts is goddamn Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I started to realize that the show might be successful when, and this is the true answer, when we got a, an A from Entertainment Weekly. Like that was a really lovely piece that was written. 
<laughs> I mean, this is right. This truth. I call him likes. I see him. Um, I was like, oh, hold on. That's a that's a magazine like that I actually trust, and and they're saying awfully nice things. Okay, and you know there are obviously uh, a few more good reviews after that, but that was the first one that kind of you know put us at ease, or at least me at ease. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Nick uh, Nick Mohammed actually sent me that review because I was like, I'm not going to look at any reviews. I don't want to know. And then I just got a text from Nick and he said, I know you said you don't want to look, have a look at this. And I saw the Entertainment Weekly review and I was like, F this is nice. I think the secret to, I don't know actually, I think, always think it's hard to answer that question if you're involved in the writing and the acting of it because you sound like a, well it's because it's very well put together. <laughs> you sound like a dickhead. You got an answer that isn't? I don't think there's any particular single secret. Like it, it's just a lot of really well chosen ingredients. Like our writers' room was really um, well curated. Our cast is excellent. Um, our our designers are excellent. Our directors are like, we have a uh, a rule or at least a hope of uh, of no turkeys. Meaning like you know, no one's a d no one's bringing everybody down and not pulling their weight. Yeah, we just have a lot of people who are good at what they do and whose hearts are in the right place and who give a about their work and what they're working on. You know, those are kind of Ted qualities to have too. So it's all of a piece. I think it's, there's an element of magic in terms of everyone had good intentions, everyone's invested in it. But the fact that the cast have such great chemistry and the crew are so like, there's a little bit of magic that you just get lucky sometimes, I think. Yeah, maybe it's magic. It's magic. What, what he said is, you know, technically interesting, but I believe it was magic. <laughs> You got a fever for the flavor little girl talk, don't you? This chap I've been seeing, John. Stamos? No, his name's John Wings Knight. Like at a sports bar, like Monday night's Wings Night down at PJ Flats. Would you please stop? Rule number one, even though it's called girl talk, sometimes it needs to be more like girlism. It, it, we're not, I'm not getting yelled at out on the street, um, uh, but you know, supposedly we're like, you know, famous now, but uh, it's the worst time ever to try to uh, enjoy the trappings of fame. I'm not getting a table at the Ivy. Uh, you know why? Because the Ivy's been closed for a year. So, I don't know, maybe there are perks yet to come, but I have I have not experienced them. Tell him by the time he gets stopped. Well, I, I'm scared because I, he might watch it, but I, I, on the road I live on, I came out of my house and the man from across the street ran across and said, I'm the biggest fan of your show. I've watched six episodes of it. I just love Ted Blasso. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know how big a fan you are. I feel like you need to do a little more research <laughs> into the title of the... Show you love. Well, that's a weird thing. The word lasso apparently is so foreign to British vernacular, it is very common for English people to pronounce it lasso, even. The, it, it's clearly not lasso. Don't have, don't have two O's. No. Or you. Uh, it's the one word in England that doesn't have an extra U. And yet, <laughs> here we are. Certainly the effect of relegation automatically imbues the desire to get promoted. So that is certainly what the team is trying to do um, in season two, because, you know, Premier League's where it's at, man. So we'll see if that happens. We were told at one point last year that one of these taps has a very low percentage beer. Once we found that out, we requested that be the only beer that we were served for any of our scenes. And then we just kept doing extra takes. You got particularly sloppy in all the pub scenes. I mean, you know, I, had, I can't remember the last time I was drinking inside of a bar. You know, we've just started drinking outside of a bar, which is, of course, an exotic thrill. Um, so, yeah, but is this real? Is this a real beer? Is this a real beer? Here, anybody? No? No, no. Oh, that's sweet. So close. So close. Thank <laughs> you.